This is the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets Wrap. Joining us today, what is it, the, the day after all the bank stress tests re- released here. Um, we have all kinds of chaos in the markets all week after a Brexit last Friday. Uh, we have our good friend James Turk out of London from goldmoney.com. James, it's great to have you back on the show. Great to be with you guys. Well, James, uh, what's your take here on the market? We're just about uh, one week past Brexit and your vote to leave the euro. Um, there's been a lot of hype made about it. There's been a lot of scaremongering that uh, the world's going to end because uh, Britain wants to be independent again. So uh, let's start out with your take on that and then its effect on the markets here, James. Uh, first of all, looking at uh, the impact on the UK, um, I think it's going to be a great thing for the UK. Uh, they're getting rid of all of the bureaucratic hassle. Uh, UK is in a strong negotiating position because it has a trade deficit with the European Union. Um, so, I mean, if the European Union tries to be tough in negotiating the exit, they'll be shooting themselves in the foot, uh, and particularly the German car manufacturers, which the UK is a major market. So I think it's all going to work out, but it's going to take a period of time, probably close to that two-year period that they're talking about. In the meantime, the UK remains part of the EU and life goes on as before, which is part of the reason that the stock market uh, the FTSE is back to the levels it was before the uh, the Brexit vote. I, you know, I think what happened is there was so much scaremongering in the papers about what would happen if the EU, um, if the uh, UK decided to leave the EU, that there was a lot of selling after the vote because it just people weren't expecting it. Uh, but now, you know, cooler heads are prevailing and they're recognizing that, hey, what's changed? Effectively nothing, although it will change longer term. What do you think about the... Uh, domestic politics. I mean, that's going to definitely be something that is a, a moving target. And you know, I, you know, you know you're being in London and spent yeah. a lot of time in the e- European Union overall. What uh, what do you make as far as how that's going to shake out? Because it seems like uh, that's going to be a, a prime source for a lot of uh, uncertainty, and that'll possibly upset markets on a going forward basis. Yeah, you know, the the United Kingdom is four nations. It's England, Wales. Northern Ireland and Scotland. Uh, Scotland and most of Northern Ireland, you know, voted against um, uh, leaving. They wanted to remain, and so they're arguing that they should. Uh, at least Scotland is arguing that they should have another referendum on becoming an independent sovereign nation, uh, and that may or may not happen. But I, I think the bottom line is that all of these political events can continue to operate in the background, uh, but we shouldn't allow that to. Dis- to take our eye off the ball, which is, of course, what's happening in the monetary sphere, you know, what central banks are doing to destroy national currencies, uh, and I think perhaps most importantly, you know, what's happening to banks around the world. All you have to do is look at the shares uh, of bank stocks, or the share prices of bank stocks, and you'll see that, you know, there's a, there's a real problem there. You know, stocks like uh, Deutsche Bank, they're trading at 25%, um, the market cap is 25% of their book value. So, you know, obviously people are looking at the banks and saying, boy, there are going to be a lot of losses yet to come in the banking system. And, you know, when you talk about losses in the banking system, with everything interconnected these days globally, you're talking about another 2008 type of event. So the question is, who's going to be the layman this time around? And there are a lot of potential targets out there. Well, that's an interesting question that a lot of people speculate about. Uh, Deutsche Bank, in fact, being layman, take you know, 2.0. <laughs> I, I'd love to get your sense uh, as to whether or not you think it's possible or indeed probable that the authorities are in the process of ring fencing Deutsche Bank and planning to actually just nationalize and make it like a, a good bank, bad bank division for assets, nationalize the punk assets and address Deutsche Bank that way. Um, you know, today it was announced that uh, the IMF said that looking at the exact quote here, among the GSIBS, globally systemic important banks, Deutsche Bank appears to be the most important net contributor to systemic risks, followed by HSBC and Credit Suisse. And, you know, we've, the markets have been aware of Deutsche Bank's problems for 18 some odd months now, and and it reminds me a lot of uh, the way uh, uh, Bear Stearns, after the Alt-A uh, subprime segment of the market blew up and their maiden lane hedge funds blew up in 2007. And then it was a long period where um, it just was 
like a walking dead bank and then finally taken out in February of 2008. Do you think that that kind of experience and then the experience of seeing Lehman Brothers take down um, the financial system in a derivatives crash and systemic you know, contagion risk spread is something that the central bankers are you know, sufficiently scared out of their minds to want to take uh, a Deutsche Bank and privatize bad, uh, the, the good assets, excuse me, nationalize the bad assets and create a new creature of some sort. Uh, well, I'm, I'm wondering if you think that that's a possible scenario that's given a lot of weight behind the scenes because uh, it, I, I am frankly skeptical of looking at Lehman Brothers as a black swan, and I know that that's particularly fashionable, uh, even in Zero Hedges reporting this morning. That's the way they're characterizing Lehman, excuse me, um, Deutsche Bank. And I'd just love your take on those uh, hypotheses that I have. Yeah, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that the central bankers are trying to circle the wagons one way or another. They're doing it with Deutsche Bank, I'm sure, although there's been nothing public from which I'm aware. Um, there have been a number of public announcements about the Italian banking system, which in the mm -hmm. aggregate is as bad as, as Deutsche Bank is by itself. Um, and there's just an announcement today that there's another, the Italian government is thinking about putting another $5 billion of uh, uh, money uh, into this uh, bad bank system that they're trying to set up. But here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that there are a lot of bad assets in the banking system that are never going to be repaid. Um, mm -hmm. And that means their losses are going to be taken. And there are only two ways that those losses can be taken. Either the taxpayers take the loss and bail out the bank, or the depositors of the bank take the loss and they bail in the bank, uh, which is something that we saw in Cyprus and also in Greece. Uh, so it's one of those two options, and they're ni neither one of them are good. Uh, so basically, what you're uh, the, the bottom line is is that you want to minimize your exposure to the banking system, and maximize your exposure to precious metals because they don't have counterparty risk. You know, when you own physical gold or physical silver, you're not reliant upon the bank, um, and that's I think the the strategy that we have to uh, use going forward from here because of all of the problems that. The global financial system faces, although the hot spot at the moment seems to be Europe. The other ramification from Brexit that's of interest is uh, how it's changed interest rate expectations on a forward basis and the whole uh, expectation for even the possibility of not seeing rates rise until 2008 is starting to be reflected by a minority opinion in the futures markets, which is pretty surprising. And um, the whole idea of uh, in a, a rate hike in 2016 is now unlikely as well. And as that percolates through the consciousness of uh, the average financial participant in our, in our grand Western financial world, uh, what do you think that that will do in terms of uh, the uh, whole precious metals backdrop for fundamentals? Well, it's obviously going to be very bullish for the precious metals. You know, I've been saying for years that the uh, Federal Reserve is not going to raise interest rates for one very simple reason. The U.S. government cannot afford to pay a fair rate of interest uh, mm -hmm. simply because it's got too much debt. Uh, you know, it's got almost $20 trillion, 20 trillion worth of debt. If you raise interest rates just, you know, 1%, so that's $200 billion a year of extra um, interest expense that has to be paid. That means they have to borrow that extra $200 billion, raising the debt even more, and you then get into the hyperinflationary spiral where you're borrowing just to pay interest, and you ultimately destroy the currency. So, you know, the Fed is there keeping interest rates at zero for that reason, and what but they can't go on forever because the debt continues to accumulate even at, at uh, zero interest rates, and we're reaching a stage which is totally ridiculous where people are actually you know, giving money to the government and expecting less less back in 10 years because of negative interest rates, which is totally absurd. We're, you know, the, the last book that uh, John and Rubino and I did uh, is The Money Bubble. And we have to recognize that the big bubble today is this money bubble. It's, you know, what people today call as money is not really money. It's only a money substitute circulating in place of money, which is, of course, gold and silver. And as people start to understand the foolishness of what's going on with regard to what central bankers are doing, negative interest rates, uh, the, the, the central you know, near bankruptcy of the, of the big welfare uh, states, 
uh, it's inevitable that we're going to go back to basics. We're going to go back to, um, you know, reversion to the mean. And if you look throughout history, every time you've been in a bubble before, people move into the financial, uh, move out of financial assets into tangible assets. And one of the tangible assets that does best in that kind of environment is the precious metals, you know, both gold and silver. But again, I'm talking about physical gold and physical silver. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that, James. I mean, we're recording today on June 30th. It's the last day of the first half of 2016. And gold's up 25% on the year. Silver's up, I think, 34 or 35% up on the year. Uh, the Hui's up almost 125% on the year. And we're only uh, six months into the year. And that sounds astonishing, and it is. But if you take a look at, say, a 10-year chart on silver, you, see, you literally can't even see the move off the lows. It's, even though percentage-wise the move has been so strong this year. Um, silver is at pretty critical resistance right here at about 1850. I think we could see a pretty exciting move if uh, silver can clear this area here, 1850, 1860, and uh, start to move to the upside. What's your take on more of the short term for gold and silver? Yeah, you know, I am so bullish on gold and silver here, particularly silver because it's cheap relative to gold. You know, I say that because I follow the gold-silver ratio, how many ounces of silver it takes to buy one ounce of gold. And the way I see silver is, you know, obviously there's some industrial components for silver and other factors that come in, but I really see it as a substitute for gold in the sense that if you have one ounce of gold or 72 ounces of silver, you are essentially have the same amount of value outside the banking system. But historically, the ratio for gold to silver is much lower. Now, what that, at, for example, in April of 2011, when silver got back to that $50 per ounce level, the ratio was 31. So I expect the gold-silver ratio to fall uh, for the foreseeable future, both in the short term, as it's been doing already this year, but continue to fall relative uh, to gold, meaning that silver is outperforming and a target of like 30 to 1, which we saw in April of 2011, is not an unreasonable to have, target to have for silver uh, in you know, the, the next year or two ahead. So you know, as gold goes to a new high uh, above 1900, which I do expect to happen probably next year, but I don't rule it out this year if we have another big financial panic, uh, silver is going to ultimately take out that 50 high and that's when the bull market in silver actually begins you know from 1980 to today silver really hasn't been in a bull market it's just been accumulating in a huge huge basing pattern it's only going to go into a bull market when we take out the 1980 high and silver is essentially the only commodity that's still trading below its 1980 high or put it this way it's the only commodity that since 1980 has not taken out its 1980 high so when that happens, then you're going to see silver just, you know, skyrocket, uh, along with gold, which will be skyrocketing as well. Have you seen a, an, an uptick this week and leading into the Brexit vote uh, from your customers at Gold Money looking to hedge against the possible turmoil from Brexit? Yeah, it, it, the business has been very good, uh, not just from the UK, but globally. Um, simply because of all of the uncertainty that's being created, not just by the Brexit vote, but by what's happening to the stock markets, what's happening to currency movements, volatility. Uh, so yes, it's, it's been very good, and which is a little bit unusual because the summer things start to slow down. But you know, every once in a while you get a summer where things actually heat up, and this could be one of those summers. <laughs> well, we, we were talking about negative interest rates a moment ago, and it was reported today that now we are at... Um 11.7 trillion dollars worth of negative interest rate sovereign debt worldwide and uh, I think that's double this year at the rate that we're seeing rates slide into negative territory uh, that alone seems to be something that can awaken a lot of the sleeping conventional financial world to just the obvious uh, attractiveness of the precious metal space uh, well it'll be interesting to see how many of the uh, more higher profile individuals uh, come to the table that has uh, you know, been getting the attention of the Soroses and others around the world. Yeah, there have been a lot of hedge fund managers that have made major pronouncements yeah. earlier this year uh, that they've and, been moving into metals, uh, and I think that you know those they're obviously being proven right. Well, it, it, it's interesting, too, because we have seen a little bit of a slowdown in China's purchases 
and uh, an uptick in Western purchases, and particularly ETF gold. And I know that you follow that pretty closely, and I was wondering if you could uh, give us some of our listeners a sense of where you're seeing just um, flows from an institutional point of view, and, and what you, what is your take as far as uh, Canadian and American and European perspectives from an institutional point of view when it comes to accumulating gold? They're only just scratching the surface. Um, you know, even with the big hedge funds that have made these announcements, people are still just looking at it um, and don't really understand, you know, the precious metals, uh, which I think is really the big problem that the, the precious metals face. You know, everybody, not everybody, uh, the majority of people still see gold and silver as speculative commodities rather than what they are, which is money. Um, you know, I always like to use the example that an ounce of gold still buys the same amount of crude oil it did 50 years ago. So when you calculate the price of goods and services in terms of gold or calculate the price of goods and services in terms of silver, you get an entirely different picture than when you calculate those same goods and services in terms of some fiat currency. Because what's happening is fiat currencies are losing purchasing power that's being eroded. Uh, even in this environment, purchasing power is, is losing um, um, uh, national currencies are losing purchasing power uh, because there's still inflation. And you have central banks saying that they're trying to create more inflation to d destroy even more rapidly the purchasing power of national currencies. What's likely to happen as we move toward the end of the year, you know, last year we got, we're going to see more inflation. Last year we got a big benefit in terms of commodity prices falling considerably. Uh, you know, oil went all the way down to $28 a barrel. But right now, oil is $48 a barrel. It's gone up 80% so far this year. That's going to have a huge inflationary impact. Now, given the fact that the inflation of goods and surf, excuse me, the inflation of services, you know, labor costs and things like that, um, they never deflated. They continued to inflate. Uh, medical expenses, they continue to inflate. Educational expenses, they continue to inflate. Now you add rising commodity prices on top of that, you're going to see much higher inflation as we go toward the end of the year. But the scary thing is, is that the economy is slowing down, which is what happened in the 1970s. You end up with stagflation, a stagnating economy and rising prices. And that's the worst of all possible worlds, but that's clearly where we're headed. Yeah. Even the velocity of money is continuing to slide down and down. There's just a, it's kind of like a deflate a, a depressionary attitude uh, with monetary stimulation leading to stagflation. Yeah, but it, I, I look at velocity slightly differently than the way most people do. The reason why velocity is declining is because there's too much money being pumped into the system relative to the economic activity. Understand my point? Yeah, that, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. And basically what I'm saying is that because there's too much money being pumped into the system relative to economic activity, that money is, is already and going to continue to result in higher uh, uh, prices and more inflation. In fact, you know, it's, I think it's seven months in a row now that inflation, even by the government's own reported statistic, is, um, and the one that the Federal Reserve you know, talks about, it's 2% inflation target. It, it's above that for at seven months at or above that for seven months in a row so why isn't the federal government raising interest rates to begin controlling inflation it's because the US government can't afford to pay a high interest rate so you know we're, what we're at is I think we're very very close to uh, a 2008 type situation but it's not going to be one that central banks are going to be able to dig themselves out of um, and I think it's going to be something that's going to be more cataclysmic. Back in 2009, when the Greece crisis started appearing, I wrote an article saying, you know, questioning whether the, uh, whether the Greek crisis might cause um, the end of socialism in terms of socialistic thinking and the way governments run the welfare states. And everything that's happened since then suggests that more and more people are starting to understand that the socialistic policies of the welfare states cannot be sustained because there's not enough wealth being created to service the debt uh, or to you know, keep governments from becoming insolvent. And I think that's the issue we're going to face next time around. It's not going to be a bank goes under, 
it's going to be some government goes under, and what the implica implications of that are going to be are, are going to be you know, totally mind-boggling, and even which makes it even more important that you own physical um, assets, minimize your financial assets, and when it comes to physical assets, as far as the money is concerned, of course that means physical gold and physical silver. Now, James, I want to ask you uh, more long-term outlook uh, a question. You were talking a moments ago about the gold-silver ratio and that you could see in the next year or two it could reach 30 to 1, and I'd agree with that. More of a long-term outlook, and as we were also talking about that uh, the real bull market only begins when silver takes out that $50 high. If we're looking down the road and we're, we're looking at the ultimate final blow-off top and what's been a, what about a 15-year bull market uh, in precious metals. Some of the numbers I look at, um, as you talked about, uh, the historical ratio has been closer to 16 to 1 for gold to silver. Um, the actual mining output coming out of the ground right now is closer to 8 or 9 to 1. And historically, when we see a blow-off runoff top, I would expect that ratio to overshoot. I think it'd be possible in a final, the final blow off top of the gold and silver bull market that you could see a five to one ratio. Do you think that's unreasonable? Do you think that's a possible ratio in a final blow off top, rhino horn type top of uh, the final move in the bull market? Yeah, uh, well, I'm pretty confident that it's gonna go below 20 to one. Uh, I would say that's probably 90% level of confidence. Whether we get down to, uh, you know, 10 to 1 or 5 to 1, the, my level of confidence would be decreasing quite considerably. But you know, um, anybody who owns silver, if we get to even 20 to 1, uh, is going to be doing very, very well. But I do agree that it is possible that in a final blow-off, that could happen. But I want to make two points. First of all, you said uh, about the, the the bull market. Uh, it's been a hundred year bull market in the precious metals. You know, back in 1913 when the Federal Reserve was created, one ounce of gold was $20.67 per ounce. It's been a, basically a one-way street. Obviously there are fluctuations, but it's been a constant debasement of the dollar. Um, it's, and I think we have to put it in terms of the long-term context. And secondly, with regard to the blow-off, um, when, you know, back in 1980, when the blow off occurred then, I kept saying to myself, this is not going to be the end of the monetary system. Um, there'll be another you know, event later on at some point in time in the future. I didn't think it was going to take this long to be quite honest, but you know, I think we're still heading in that direction. And it will be not like a 1980 blow off where you sold your precious metals and went back into dollars. It's going to be a new type of blow off where you actually spend the gold and silver that you're accumulating now because dollars and all other national currencies will be totally discredited. So it's going to, you're gonna know when the blow off occurs because it's gonna be people will want to accept your, your gold and silver and for goods and services, not for dollars. That might even change the entire nature of the last 10% uh, of any bull market move and a blow off top, you might not even have it. If we have a new currency regimes and everything uh, being replaced. I mean, we might never get that 5 to 1 ratio, Doc, uh, because by the time we hit 15 and we have the beginnings of the blow-off top, who knows, uh, you know, maybe rational thinking policy will begin to try to address our monetary system at the same time. And it'll be like what James posits, where on the other side of whatever kind of transition that people are insuring themselves against by their acquiring of precious metals holdings. Uh, and, you know, that's, a, that, that's a very good point. Uh, and it goes to the very basic premise that we cannot predict the future. So exactly. how, do we, how do we prepare for the future? What we do is we accumulate undervalued useful assets and get rid of overvalued assets. And right now, one of the most undervalued useful assets in my mind are physical gold and physical silver. Yeah, very good point. Anything else that uh, you'd like to chime in on, James, or Doc, question about? In a short-term basis, you know, I'm very encouraged that we're up here at 1850. We're almost broken out from this long-term basing pattern. Um, my gut feeling is that maybe we have one more retracement back to 18 before we break out. But regardless, the upside potential is far more 
significant than any downside risk you have from here. And that's just from a trading point of view. You know, from a long-term point of view, you know, continue, which has been my recommendation, you know, since I started Gold Money back in 2001, just, you know, every month, whenever your family budget allows it, you know, plan for it, just dollar cost average, continue to accumulate physical gold and physical silver. Because when this, when this, these monetary events are finally over, uh, you're going to be very, very happy that you protected yourself and your family with those precious metals that you're accumulating at these, at, at, at these prices. You're saving money. Uh, and even better than that, you're saving sound money. And I think a lot of times people lose track of that just in the day-to-day of all the mope across the, the media and watching uh, gold and silver prices go down over the past four or five years that ultimately, number one, their financial insurance and protecting your wealth. They're not, uh, they're not a Vegas bet that you're uh, going all in hoping to uh, strike it rich on gold and silver. Now, for, I think it's quite possible that uh, you could – gain and likely will because as we've been talking they are so undervalued but um number one their insurance and wealth preservation means yeah absolutely they protect purchasing power over long periods of time and they do it because you have money um because of the history of gold and and silver in terms of you know the way they're accumulated but also they they're giving you money outside the banking system which this moment in time uh, and you know, going forward for the foreseeable future is, in my mind, something that's very important. Before we let you go, I'd love to ask you a question about what your perspectives are when it comes to the future of um, money itself and how central bankers are beginning to flirt with uh, the blockchain technology. And, and you know, you, you have a tremendous experience when it comes to understanding gold and its relation to possible payment systems and, and your work in this area with Bitcoin and gold money. Where do you think, uh, where, do you, where do you think the powers that be are going? <laughs> how, how are they going to wrangle blockchain technology and where do you see their strategizing and, and uh, where possibly even Bitcoin or other technologies could fit into that kind of a paradigm as it evolves in the future? You know, there's a, a saying that Winston Churchill had when he was talking about Americans. This goes back uh, during the mm-hmm. Second World War, that uh, they'll they'll do the right thing, but only after doing all of the wrong things first. Uh, so, in other words, you know, they're going to experiment with a lot of different things, fiat currency, blockchains, and whatnot, before they eventually go back to gold and silver. Now, that doesn't mean to say that the blockchain doesn't have a role to play. I think it does. It's a very important technological development in my mind, and I've been making that point for quite some time. And I think people will continue to move into cryptocurrencies as an alternative to national currencies. But at the end of the day, um, you know, governments will either come, uh, they're going to come back into the precious metals, and they'll either do it in a logical way uh, with, you know, a five-year plan as to how they return the currency to a gold backing or they're going to do it um, kicking and screaming and the market will drive them back to it and only time will tell because it's really going to depend on the decisions of politicians and central bankers in the future as to you know what they choose to do uh, but yeah you know blockchain is interesting but you know at the end of the day um, gold's got a 5,000 uh, and gold and silver have 5,000 year histories as money Uh, And I think that means a lot. All right, uh, James, it's great to have you back with us. Thanks for joining us again. It's always great to be with you, John and Eric. And let's do it again in the future because I think this is going to be a pretty exciting year for the precious metals. We'll look forward to it. All right, for uh, James Turk of BitGold and GoldMoney.com, this is the Doc and Eric Dubin. Thanks for tuning into this week's SD Weekly Metals and Markets. Yeah, you know, the, the United Kingdom is four nations. It's England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and Scotland. Uh, Scotland and most of Northern Ireland, you know, voted against um, uh, leaving. They wanted to remain. And so they're arguing that they should, uh, at least Scotland is arguing that they should have another referendum on becoming an independent sovereign nation. Uh, And that may or may not happen. But I, I think the bottom line is that all of these political events can continue to operate in the background, uh, but we shouldn't allow that to to take our eye off. This is the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets Wrap. 
Joining us today, what is it, the, the day after all the bank stress tests re released here, um, we have all kinds of chaos in the markets all week after a Brexit last Friday. Uh, we have our good friend James Turk out of London from goldmoney.com. James, it's great to have you back on the show. Great to be with you guys. Well, James, uh, what's your take here on the market? We're just about uh, one week past Brexit and your vote to leave the euro. Um, there's been a lot of hype made about it. There's been a lot of scaremongering that uh, the world's going to end because uh, Britain wants to be independent again. So uh, let's start out with your take on that and then its effect on the markets here, James. Uh, first of all, looking at uh, the impact on the UK, um, I think it's going to be a great thing for the UK. Uh, they're getting rid of all of the bureaucratic hassle. Uh, UK is in a strong negotiating position because it has a trade deficit with the European Union. Um, so, I mean, if the European Union tries to be tough in negotiating the exit, they'll be shooting themselves in the foot, uh, in particular because it just people weren't expecting it. Uh, but now, you know, cooler heads are prevailing and they're recognizing that, hey, what's changed? Effectively nothing, although it will change longer term. What do you think about the uh, domestic politics? I mean, that's going to definitely be something that is a, a moving target. And, you know, you know, you're being in London and spent yeah. a lot of time in the European Union overall. What, uh, what do you make as far as how that's going to shake out? Because it seems like uh, that's going to be a, a prime source for a lot of uh, uncertainty, and that'll possibly upset markets on a going-forward basis. Particularly the German car manufacturers, which the U.K. is a major market. So I think it's all going to work out, but it's going to take a period of time, probably close to that two-year period that they're talking about. In the meantime, the UK remains part of the EU and life goes on as before, which is part of the reason that the stock market, uh, the FTSE, is back to the levels it was before the, uh, the Brexit vote. I, you know, I think what happened is there was so much scaremongering in the papers about what would happen if the EU, um, if the uh, UK decided to leave the EU, that there was a lot of selling after the vote.